Hello, and welcome to another one of our Okta Office Hour sessions. I'm Randall. I'm going to be your host today. Uh, for those of you who, who don't know me already, um, I am a developer advocate here at Okta. I currently lead our developer advocacy group. And my background is in web security, cryptography, building and scaling large applications. So I'm more than happy to talk about any of those things. And I'm joined by two of my absolutely amazing colleagues. So first off, we have Aaron Parecki. Um, Aaron is one of the authors of the OAuth2 protocol. He's super active in the web security community. He works on a project called IndieWeb, which I will let him talk about in a moment because I think it's fascinating and he's a great person. Um, Aaron, do you want to give the audience a little more context about yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Aaron. Nice to be here. And yeah, I am heavily involved in the OAuth working group, writing, writing the specs and helping move that work forward as well as the uh, IndieWeb community, which is all about data ownership and online privacy, online identity, something that is clearly becoming very important these days. And um, it's been a, a, a lot of fun to have that community going as well, helping people own their data and have a web presence that does not rely on things like Twitter. So yeah, I'm just, I just really enjoy doing things around security and uh, online privacy. Thanks, Aaron. And then next we have Micah Silverman. Micah is an absolutely incredible programmer. He's been active in the web security space for many years now. He's a pro on basically everything. Um, Micah, you want to give a little more information about yourself to the audience? Yeah, sure. Uh, so Micah Silverman, like Randall said, and I, um, I'm kind of like a jack of all trades, maybe master of none, but uh, my title here is staff security hacker. I like to break things and then hopefully fix them. And I spend a lot of time writing everything from proofs of concept to uh, fully blown production code that's in use both, both internally and externally with for good security all around it. Awesome. So today we're going to be answering all of your questions live. So if you do have questions, please drop them into the chat room. I'll be going through and you know just selecting them. And if you need further clarification or follow up afterwards, just respond in the chat and I will do my absolute best to make sure we have that. Um, it looks like we had a question come in already. So the first question is from Ryan. So thanks, Ryan. And his question says, we have an application that sits behind an SSL VPN. It has different URLs for both internal and external access. We set up a SAML template app to access it internally using the internal SSO. Okay, I, I don't see the question in there, Ryan. Add, add some more context and we'll get back to that one, okay? <laughs> in the meantime, we do have some other questions, so we'll jump to that. Um, so Benjamin asks, what is the best method for keeping your API tokens secure? Now, this question is a little vague, Benjamin, so I'm going to break it up into a few sections that we'll answer for you. Um, so first of all, uh, Aaron, let's talk about what people can do to keep their API tokens secure in the browser. So let's say for a moment that someone has a web app using the auth code flow with Pixie, and so they're getting a token in a browser-based application like React or Angular or Vue, something like that. What can that developer do on the client side to help keep that token secure? Yeah, so I guess there's two parts to this. There's the part of where you get the token, and then the after you get the token, how do you make sure you keep it secure? Keeping the, keeping the token secure when you are getting the token is going to be primarily by using the authorization code flow with Pixie. And Pixie is a mechanism that will protect that, that flow and make sure the token is delivered in a secure way in contrast to the implicit flow where the token is delivered in a not very secure way. So that's the first part. Second part of that is after you have the token, where do you keep it? And this is where it gets a little bit messy in browsers. There isn't actually a very good solution. The best you can kind of do is put it somewhere where your app can reach it. And wherever your app can reach it, the downside is any attackers who can run cross-site scripting vulnerabilities on your app can also reach it. So. It doesn't really matter in the end where whether your app is storing in a cookie or local storage or session storage or whatever, because those all are vulnerable to the same cross-site scripting uh, vulnerability possibility. If you want to make sure that that's not a possibility, you have basically two options. One, don't put tokens in the browser in the first place. Move it all to the server side. If that's not an option, 
there's a sort of clever workaround for this using a service worker in the browser. And a service worker is, it's, it's kind of like a little isolated place where code can run that the browser DOM does not have access to, which means it actually can be used to store tokens there. It takes a bit of work to set that up. There's some other downsides there as well, but that's a pattern that's a possibility for, for keeping tokens there instead of just in the regular browser DOM. Okay, so Micah, I'm going to let you handle the second part. So because Benjamin's question was a little vague, let's also uh, take into account what if he meant that he has the Okta SSWS tokens, like the Okta API key that he's using to access the Okta API to make requests for the management things like creating users, you know, doing things like that. Um, is there any particular advice you have for him around keeping that type of a token secure? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, the short story is that type of token, that fixed, unchanging API token can never be in something like a spa app. It's just not, excuse me, it's just not safe to have it there because people will pull it out. And once that's leaked, it's it gives you access to everything in Okta. So first step is you just have to have middleware in this case. You, you know, your spa app will work just fine it just has to communicate with some .NET or Spring or, or Node.js or some kind of middleware. So then the question is, well, on my middleware, let's say I've deployed it to Heroku or Azure or whatever, how do I keep that API token safe there? And there's a lot of different techniques. Kind of the lowest bar is as an environment variable. So you don't ever want to have it uh, hard-coded in your code anywhere. You definitely don't want to have it living on GitHub. Those are mistakes that, you know, we have lots of reference points that people have made. And, and again, once that API token is leaked, it's kind of game over. Um, so at least as an environment variable, and the different frameworks have different ways to pull in properties and things like that, but you want to keep it completely separate from your code base. And then you can get into more sophisticated approaches like um, storing it in a, in a, a key management service like uh, AWS, uh, Amazon has KMS for, for key management. It just gives you an extra layer of, of security if somehow your uh, deployment environment were compromised in some way, maybe the, the, the key, the AP, that API token won't be uh, leaked even in that event if you're using something more sophisticated. For proofs of concept and, and hobby projects and things like that, I use Heroku a lot and I just have it stored as an environment variable, never anywhere near the code. And that's that's safe enough in most cases. Awesome. All right, well, Benjamin, hopefully that answers your question. If you do wanna know about some specific API token security stuff, please respond in here and let me know and we'll go in more depth. Um, all right, next, let's take a question from Anna. So Anna asked a question a couple of minutes ago. She said, hey, I'm new to Okta and I wanna ask if you have any information or samples that showcase using or building like an ASP.NET MVC application and integrating it with Okta using OpenID Connect and SAML for SSO. So Anna, yes, we do have a bunch of those. Um, I'm gonna share my screen right now just to show you how to find them because there are quite a few. So if I share my screen for a moment here, I think you should be able to see it now. Keep me honest. There we go, okay. Uh, but what you can do is go to our developer site, all right? It's developer.okta.com, click on docs up at the top, and then click on .NET here if you're looking for .NET uh, apps. So we have official sample apps here. Then we also have a bunch of blog posts that walk you through doing things linked uh, down here. And we have you know, the official sample apps, there's a bunch. They show you how to do things in a bunch of different ways so you can check those out. And our blog posts are really great if you want more in-depth information about like how to actually build stuff, so play around here. If you do have other things you're looking for, um, what you can do is literally search like developer.octa.com plus .net, and you will find tons and tons of information and sample apps that we have uh, on there. So hopefully that helps you out. And uh, yeah, let me know if you need any more info there. All right, so next question, let's see. One second here. This admin panel is a little slow today. All right. Okay, so next question is by Veronica. So Veronica says, okay, enter submits the form, she says. All right, multiple partners will be accessing our Okta secured app and they all have different identity providers. Okay, that's like pretty common. 
Um, besides spinning up a new Okta instance for each partner, how could we provide access to each partner's users? Micah, do you want to care to take that one? So each of their partners has different uh, identity providers, and they don't want to spin up a new Okta instance for every single partner. So how do they easily provide access to all those users? Yeah, so Okta has a pretty rich uh, external identity provider uh, connectors, a bunch of them. So if it's using some sort of standard, if these external identity providers are using some sort of standard like SAML or OpenID Connect, um, uh, those are the, the most common ones, but we also have other connectors in Okta's integration network. Then you set up Okta as kind of a, a proxy in between. So the, the experience for your users is that they would authenticate in the usual way uh, let's say through Salesforce or something, and then they would have a, a presence in your Okta org. But how they how they got there, you would you would see on there on the user in Okta that it was um, an IDP connected, an identity provider connected uh, user account in that case. So you can uh, partition up those communities of users in whatever way makes sense. You might. Um, set up a rule so that you know people coming in from Salesforce automatically are assigned to a particular group. And then maybe that group is assigned to a particular application. So you can have multiple applications in Okta and you can partition up your users in, in various different ways. But if it's one big application and, and you just need to know, you know where they came from, you have all that information from their uh, profile based on how they connected to, to Okta in the first place. Uh, and in a lot of cases, we can automatically link different ways that people have connected. Usually it's done on email, but if you have some kind of common glue that identifies a user uniquely, then you can link up the different accounts. So even though they may have logged in from Google one day and Salesforce another day, Okta knows that that's all still the same user and and treats that as one identity does that make sense i think i think that's a pretty good answer um let us know if you need more clarification there and we'll dive more into it okay great um also lance uh, just submitted a, a a comment he said micah i recently watched your push pull authentication video it was very helpful thank you so shout out to micah and thanks thanks lance um hooray all right, let's pull up the next question here. There's quite a few today, <laughs> a lot of stuff. Okay, so uh, Brian writes, I'm trying to do a quick proof of concept for provisioning and deprovisioning using event hooks with the developer environment, and I'm getting stuck here. And he, hold on, he links out to the verification request. That request does not seem to return what is stated in the docs, the X Okta verification challenge. I want to make sure it's still a valid option and I'm looking at the correct things to get a POC done. Hey, Brian, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to copy this URL that you sent over here because it's going to take a while to debug that live, especially if you're not getting the responses that are documented there. And we can look at that afterwards and send you an email when we have time to play around with it. Um, if you want to submit another comment on here with your email address, I'll get back to you with that afterwards, okay? Um, and thanks. And sorry, sorry you're running into problems, by the way. Uh, all right, let's see. What's the next question? Um, all right, I had a query on step up authentication. What is it and how does Okta support it? All right, so uh, there's more to the question, but let's pause there for a moment to talk about what is step up authentication. And this is from uh, Jamie, by the way. So, Jamie, step up authentication, what that means is think of it like this. Let's say you're, you're logging into GitHub, right? So you're working on a project. Well, when you first log into GitHub, you're gonna be prompted for your email and your password and maybe multi-factor, okay? And so you log into GitHub, you authenticate with an SMS factor or using push base, you know, MFA or whatever it is, your YubiKey device, and you're in GitHub. And you're going through and you're doing things and you're still logged in and it's fine. But what happens if you go to your GitHub account settings and you try to do something really sensitive, like change your password? Well. What you'll notice when you go to do that in GitHub is when you click like, I want to change my password, GitHub will ask you for your original password again and force you to do another MFA 
to make sure that it's actually you. And this is called step of authentication. It's basically when you, someone's already logged into your product, excuse me, but you make them authenticate again before they do something sensitive, just to 100% make sure that this is actually the person that you think they are before they do this like potentially destructive operation. So imagine I'm at Starbucks, I'm logged into my GitHub account, I go to buy a coffee and someone takes my laptop and tries to change my password. Well, they wouldn't be able to because of step up authentication. And so step up authentication is like really nice. Uh, we actually have some guides for this, by the way. So if I, I'll pull it up right now, over coffee.com plus step up authentication. Uh, one second. Ah, here we go. So we actually have a a couple articles on our website that show you how to oh, trying to pull it up right now on the screen share. Step up. Off. So I'll I'll link to that in a moment. I'm trying to pull it up here. So let me read the second part of the question. There's some documentation in the Authn API where they mention service provider and identity provider initiated step up auth, but I'm un unsure of the use cases where it would be used. So yes, to answer your question, you want to do it in your product before a sensitive operation. If I was building a banking website, I would definitely enforce step up authentication before someone transfers more than like $10,000, let's say, or something like that, or submits a wire transfer or something. Um, and yeah, uh, if I share my screen real quick, if you just Google developer.octa.com plus step up off, you can find the stuff I'm, I'm showing on here, but there's some docs in our help center and there's some blogs you can click through and actually like read here. So give that a shot and let us know if you have other questions. So thanks, Jamie. All right. Uh, next question. Um, Let's see. Okay. Lou asks, I haven't been able to figure out a way in the Okta API to do filtering on the server side so that only a subset of data can be returned from the API. Is there something I am missing? If you are querying for a lot of data, it slows things down not being able to do server side filtering. So uh, Lou, you can like perform search queries in the Okta API. Uh, like for example, if you want to list users, you don't have to like hit the user's endpoint and paginate through every user. You can like narrow it down based on particular fields and things. I think what you should do is check that out. If you look at, let me pull this up. I'll share my screen again real fast. If you go to our docs and go to our API reference information, Where's API overview? I thought I was just on there. Yeah, there's a section on filtering here that you're going to want to read. So go to the docs reference overview and scroll down to where it says filtering. And this will help you, you know, narrow things down so you're not just paginating through millions of records potentially. So give that a go. Let me know if you want more specific information there. All right. All right. So next question, let's see. Hey, Randall, just to uh, add to that last point, the, mm -hmm. um, the, the Postman collections uh, can help you kind of prototype that out. We have a bunch of collections for uh, the management API for creating, but also for searching, and you can play around with those filtering parameters right in Postman if you want to see the results and and, and play around with different uh, filters. Absolutely, that's a good point, Micah, thanks. All right, next question is from, uh, I hope I'm saying this right, Jalant. And Jalant says, which is the easiest way of managing credentials stored inside of an on-premise database? So I'm not sure if this is necessarily a migration to Okta question, I think it is, but let's assume that what, what they mean by this is they have a database where they have usernames and password hashes that they're doing custom authentication for today. And they want to move into Okta. What's the best way for Okta to like take over these credentials and manage them? Uh, Micah, you want to take that one? Yeah, we, uh, we recently uh, updated and published a migration guide that goes through um, a bunch of different 
scenarios, which um, I'll I'll share in just a second. Um, but you know, there there's a, a kind of a fixed number of of approaches and ways to do it. The best way, or the, I should say, the easiest way, is if you have access to those hashes and they're in a format that Okta, Okta can ingest, then you can just hit an API endpoint and and migrate all of your users in, in one shot. Um, and it might be the kind of thing that you do over a weekend, maybe you'd have a very small window of downtime just so people didn't mess around with their credentials while you were doing it, but you could do it all in one shot. And then, excuse me, and then the other, the other probably most most frequently done way is let's say you don't have access to that but you still have some on-prem uh, authentication system what what we have you do is kind of create a, a little shim software that allows you to create to your current uh, uh, authenticate to your current system and you have that that little window of opportunity where you've captured the plain text password and verified that it's valid through your existing system and then at that point, you create an, an Okta user uh, and you set the credential because you know it for that very brief window. And then that individual user is considered migrated. And typically you would run a program for some set amount of time, say 60 days. And over that time, some large percentage of your active users would be migrated over to Okta. And then kind of as a final step, you would you would cut over to Okta and for that, let's say 10% of users that weren't active or didn't authenticate, you would send them all like a bulk password reset email, which you can also do through the Okta API. And then you catch some percentage of those of those stragglers. But at that point, you could kind of decommission your your legacy system because everything would be migrated over to Okta. There's a couple of other techniques and things in between, but those are kind of the most, the most uh, frequent or the most popular ways to migrate data, uh, migrate authentication and uh, profiles and such over to Okta. And cool. I think, yeah, uh, go ahead and continue. I'm going to find the um, that migration guide reference, and then I'll just uh, post it in the chat or or share my screen for a sec. Yeah, actually, why don't, if you pull that up, why don't you share your screen for a moment? But I know yeah. just to help Jalant out later, if you're looking for it, just Google, you know, developer.octa.com plus migration. Oh, yeah, I have it. And you should be able to find that pretty easily. We have a couple guides that walk you through this. Yeah, let me, um, no, I've lost my window. Here we go. Let me, uh, let me share my screen here. Uh, here we go. Sorry, it's a little slow. So uh, are you seeing my screen now? Yep. Okay, cool. Yeah, so um, if you go to guides, there's this uh, migration guide and it starts with a bunch of prerequisites and it goes through basically what I just uh, described. And the one thing that I didn't uh, touch on that's worth saying because it's relatively new is um, what I described was kind of a very manual way of syncing uh, passwords. We now have this um, inline password hook that makes it a lot easier. Um, and basically you would create all of your users in Okta without passwords, and then you could use an inline password hook to query the old system and set the password in Okta kind of on the fly. Uh, so it's actually evolved over the years now, and it doesn't have to be uh, quite as much manual labor anymore. Great. Well, Jalan, hopefully that helps you out. Um, I'm going to move right along. There's a lot of questions today. We're doing our best to get to all of them. <laughs> so we'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, so Ryan had a few questions as well. Uh, Ryan said, Hey, are there any new features on the roadmap for admins? Are there any new features on the roadmap for end users? Are there going to be any changes or improvements to our CM connectors? So to answer your question, Ryan, the answer is yes. There is a lot of things planned. Um, we are not allowed to talk about specifics of that, unfortunately. But one thing you can do, which I would recommend all of you do, so this is going to be relevant to anyone who wants to see the new stuff coming out, is go to octane21.com. This is our conference we run every year. It This year in 2021, it's April 6th through the 8th. 
and it's free and it's online. You can attend. It doesn't cost any money. And it's super amazing. We have tons of great talks there. We announce all the new stuff for the year. So we'll show you all the new things we've been working on, all the cool you know, changes to the products that we have. So definitely register for this if you aren't already, because this is going to answer almost all of your roadmap questions. Um, it looks like, Ian, you also had a question about, is there a roadmap for a workstation MFA client? So you should come here and check out the MFA sessions as well. Uh, I think you'll be happy with some of those. Um, there's a few other roadmap questions in here as well. I won't go through all of them, but check out Octane. We will talk about everything then, I promise. And sorry, I can't give you more, more information right now. I feel terribly guilty about that. Uh, okay, um, here's a question for you, Aaron. So Ken asks, uh, as I'm building additional applications using Okta, should I be migrating more of them to OIDC than SAML and, and why? Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I am definitely in favor of migrating everything into OpenID Connect over SAML at this point. SAML is essentially um, a legacy spec. It, it works fine for what it does, but all of the sort of new stuff and new work in the spec development world is happening in OpenID Connect. So that's much more future-proof for making sure that you're going to be able to support more things in the future. There's also the that's also where like the security fixes to the actual spec are being made. So SAML is kind of just frozen in time, whereas OIDC is being updated and is getting uh, best practices are being you know up, rolled out and then products get updated to match. And I would I would 100% go that direction. That's definitely where the future is heading. Fantastic. Um, one other thing I'll just mention briefly too. Uh, if you if you want to look up some of the reasons why like OIDC and SAML are are sort of the way they are and why you may not want to use SAML for stuff, Google developer.octa.com plus SAML. We have written a few articles where we go in depth and talk about like, hey, like here's some SAML vulnerabilities that are common and here's things you might want to avoid. So uh, you know, one of the big parts too is like SAML is a much older protocol and OIDC is way nicer. <laughs> Thanks in part to the work that people like Aaron have done to just make it much smoother and just generally more secure for people. So, you know, definitely check it out if you're not already using it's, it. I, th I think it's also worth noting that um, SAML is like OIDC in that it's great for SSO, but it's really not suitable for uh, things like your um, securing your backend APIs. That's not what it was ever intended for. And when you have OpenID Connect, because it rides on top of OAuth, you kind of get that that for free. So OADC gives you the, I, the ID token, um, but if you're using one of the standard flows, you can also get an access token, and then you can start interacting with backend APIs. So it's kind of one stack to manage the, the kind of authentication and authorization needs you'd have in a modern app. If you start out with SAML, and then you have a backend API, you're probably going to be doing some sort of OAuth flow anyway, and now you have kind of two technologies in your stack. So you get all that, you know, in, in one shot with OpenID Connect and OAuth. Fantastic. Um, all right, next question. Jamie had a follow-up from before. Uh, they said, hey, regarding the step-up auth question from last time, is the user forced to complete primary auth again or just, like, verify a factor? And the answer is it could be either. So it's really up to you how you want to handle that. Um, neither one is wrong. So whatever way you prefer. Um, I think just generally, it, it makes more sense to go through the entire process, uh, like at least verifying the primary factor uh, once again, because you know you want to make sure that the person has access to a password because that's going to cover the physical case the most. But either one of those things is, is honestly fine. Um, you've, you've probably... Uh... You know, people that are that are with us today have probably experienced step up authentication and maybe didn't even realize it. I I see it most frequently on uh, Amazon, where I can I'm in an authenticated state. I can browse around. I can add things to my card. I might even be able to check out my card. But if I want to go look at previous orders or change my credit card info, it then asks me to put my password in just to verify that. You know, I, I I really am who I say I am, and not just do something, you know, like uh, switch a credit card or or you know look at previous orders or something. 
Yep. All right, let's move on to the next question. So Clarence, we're going to get to yours next. Clarence had a question about progressive profiling and Clarence says, Hey, are there any docs for enabling progressive profiling for your user profiles? Basically incrementally requesting profile information. So, uh, let me answer like this. The Okta API allows you to retrieve the profile information in a single HTTP request. So you can't break that up. However, uh, using the Okta identity engine, which is like a relatively new feature that we have, um, you can do progressive profiling. So if you Google, like I just pulled this up right now, um, we have a few things on our website that talk about this in more detail, uh, oh, there's a screen share. So we talk about how to do progressive profiling here. This is like the press release, but the more like useful stuff is here. So one of our other developer advocates, Joel, who's absolutely amazing. Um, wrote an article about configuring progressive profile for your apps. So if you just look up like Octa plus progressive profiling, you'll find this, this will actually walk you through the exact steps you need to take to do this in a, in an app that you're building. So Clarence, please check this out. And if you do have questions, let us know so we can get you like specific information to help with that stuff. Um, all right, next, uh, let's see, let's see, uh, Okay, Jahai asked a question. Aaron, Micah, either one of you can take this. Um, how can I deal with the expiration of my AWS session token in my code? So this isn't really an Okta specific question, um, which is fine, but like, how, let's just assume what they mean by this is, how do you handle it when you have a, a token that's expiring in your, your application? Like, what do you do? Maybe Aaron, you could start off. Yeah, I guess there's two different ways to handle it. So if you're using OAuth, first of all, then that's there's a mechanism called the refresh token. And the idea with the refresh token is that is a way for your application to get a new access token without involving the user again. So behind the scenes, usually from your server side code, it can also work from, from a mobile app or JavaScript app. That application can just go ahead and make an API request using the refresh token, getting a new access token, and the user will never see anything and it'll just carry on. If you don't have that option, then usually the only other way to do it is to actually basically start from scratch. You start the flow over again and you redirect the user out to the OAuth server. Now, the user may or may not actually get prompted to log in again. That's gonna depend on the OAuth server. That's gonna depend on how it's set up and lifetimes and other considerations there. So it may actually be very quick to redirect out and back, and they may not notice it happening, but it will be a full redirect to go to the OAuth server and back. Whoops, I was muted. Fantastic. All right, thanks, Aaron. I think that's going to be helpful for them. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, next question on here. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, one of the earlier questions was uh, fully uh, written in. So Ryan, we're coming back to you. We did not forget about you. So Ryan says, Hey, I have an application that lives behind the VPN, uh, which is happening over SSL or TLS. It has different URLs for both internal and external access, this app. They set up a SAML template using the internal SSO URL for internal access. Whoops. And the application only allows a single identity provider. We want to have users single sign on into the app from outside of the VPN. We need to use a second external SSO URL when signing in from off network. Is there a way to create a custom app that has two different SSO URLs and can pick the right one for both on network and off network access? I'm actually not really sure about this. Uh, Micah, Aaron, do either of you have an idea of, of how to configure that within Okta? Uh, the, the only thing that comes to mind is um, potentially taking advantage of some of the like uh, discovery stuff that we have um, that's typically in the context of identity provider discovery this this may not exactly be that but if it's you know usually it's something like uh, based on the email address they put in that will you know kick you in different directions for different identity providers in this case, it doesn't sound like that's exactly what we're dealing with. It may be the same user just coming from different URLs or something, but they're, uh, so I don't have a more specific answer, but that may at least give a clue about, you know, how you might want to uh, approach this particular problem. 
Yeah, the other thing you might wanna do potentially, Ryan, I'm thinking about this a little more as I'm rereading this question in my head. You might just wanna create two separate Okta apps, one with the internal URL and one with the external URL. And you could configure them basically the same, but with two different URLs. And as long as they're accessible, you could have them set up with the same policies and same user lists and stuff like that. You might be able to get around the problem by doing that. It's not 100% clean solution, but I think it would allow you to make things work at, in a way you're looking for. So maybe try those things out. Um, if you do need more help, by the way, just so all of you know, like there's a ton of questions today. I'm not sure if we'll be able to get to all of them. Please send us an email to developers at Okta.com. Uh, that's our email address where you'll get in touch with an actual developer here at Okta who can help you out or escalate things if we need to, to other teams, if we need to figure out things for you, stuff like that. So feel free to hit us up there too if we aren't able to get to it today. All right, let's see. Next question. Okay, uh, Stephen. Stephen asks, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Stephen. Uh, we are trying to come up with a touchless login and enrollment process for new employees. There doesn't, excuse me, there does not seem to be a way to pre-populate a user's MFA factors to allow them to log in on day one in a passwordless fashion. Is there a way for us to pre-program a user's SMS number, for example, and allow them to reset their password without the user having their password initially. So uh, the answer to this question is that it's it's sort of kind of a thing. So we have this feature called Okta Identity Engine. It's a new thing that we have. Um, we announced it a while ago. You can actually use it in beta today. But Okta Identity Engine is sort of like our version of refactoring the Okta APIs almost. It allows a lot of additional functionality including things like this, where you have non-traditional login flows that maybe don't require a password. So if you are using Okta on an enterprise plan, reach out to your sales rep and talk to them about Okta Identity Engine and say like, hey, this is something we might want to play around with or get early access to. They might be able to help you get that going. Um, and once you have access to that, a lot of these things become uh, possible. So hopefully that answers your question, Stephen. And what, one other thing I would add real quick, Randall, is mm -hmm. um, so sometimes we find our customers get a little tripped up where uh, we treat factor enrollment and factor enforcement separately. And we've had situations where people have uh, set up factor enrollment, but not actually enabled enforcement. So, you know, users will put in their number the first time and get an SMS and enroll, and then they'll never have to do it again because they never set up enforcement. Um, and so, so that's something you want to look at too, whether it's a, a Okta identity engine or not, you need to make sure that both enrollment and enforcement are configured properly. And, um, by setting things as required, you can, uh, force your users to have to enroll in, um, SMS, for instance, uh, traditionally that's done after you authenticate, but like Randall was saying, with some of the new features, you can you can have more exotic or, or different kinds of workflows for how you want to manage authentication. But just make sure you got both pieces of the puzzle configured properly, both enrollment and enforcement. Absolutely. All right, so next question is from Christopher. So Christopher says, hey, why is the search function in the Okta admin panel so broken? I have to memorize the first part of the name of a group in order to find a group. Like it's limited to a hundred items, so I can't browse it. Why is the front page of Okta what users use in instant search, but that isn't available to be used anywhere else in the admin console. So first of all, Christopher, sorry you're having a bad experience with that, but I have really good news for you. We're uh, literally days away from releasing an updated skin on our admin UI. Uh, this is something that's been in the works for quite a while. So let me just give you some history and context here to help you understand like some of the stuff we're doing and like why we're doing it this way. So a lot of the admin UI today is sort of like a thin wrapper around the Okta API, right? Like it just lets you do things. And one of the things we've been working on for quite a while now is that the Okta product has two disparate user bases. We have on one side, people using Okta for like IT use cases, like for example, you know, letting people log into their workspaces or log into apps using SSO. Then we have the people on this call, and I just assume all of you are like developers building custom applications using Okta to manage the authentication and identities of your users, right? And today, both of those user bases have totally different admin consoles. So IT admins have like one look and feel, developers have a completely separate look and feel. 
Well, over the last couple of years, our design team and UX team have been working to build a central console that's going to work for everyone and have full feature parity. So what that means is that like all the stuff you can do with the API will be accessible via the UI. And so instead of basically us putting a lot of time and effort into maintaining the existing UIs, we've been pouring all this effort into making this new one and getting it ready. And I'm really happy to, to say that like that's actually going to be coming out really soon. So we were hoping to get that out in December before the holidays. It got pushed back towards the end of this month. But you can expect to see the new, new UI before our annual conference Octane, which I think is pretty exciting if you're using our developer plans anyways. So please be on the lookout for that. That should hopefully help solve some of these issues. And sorry you've been running into those problems. Hopefully that answers your question, by the way. All right. So next question is by Eileen. And she has an IT related question. So Micah, Aaron, either of you want to take this one, that's fine. Uh, I have some employees who use Okta in restrictive spaces that do not allow plugin connectors while using browser plugins. Is there any alternatives we can offer them? So in this customer environment, these employees work in, um, for security reasons, it's really locked down, but it also means that unless the SSO, um, or unless the application the user is trying to access is using SAML instead of SWA, they can't log in without the Okta plugin. Are there any out of the box solutions you can recommend? So basically what Eileen's asking is, we have people using Okta for IT to do single sign-on into apps. And some of the apps they have require the Okta browser plugin to work because they don't support SAML, they don't support OpenID Connect, and we need to you know, pre-populate the email and password in the browser. So she's wondering, in these environments where we can't install the Okta browser plugin, is there a way to make that work? Uh, Micah, Aaron, you want to cover this one? I'm just trying to think of um, what alternatives you might have. Uh, you know, SWA is is kind of Okta's password vault approach, and if it if it doesn't support yeah standards like Saminal or OIDC, and you can't have the browser plugin, then I'm not sure how you can get the benefit of of Okta's uh, SWA. I, I think I the, have the plugin is one... kind of a requirement there. I have one thought, which is m maybe a little bit unconventional, but that is to set up a proxy in front of that application that does the authentication. So I've actually done this several times for other for things like at home or for other for other services where the application I'm trying to protect doesn't support any standards itself or doesn't even have any concept of authentication. And you can set up a proxy in front of that application where that proxy speaks OpenID Connect, can talk to Okta using OIDC, and then only after you authenticate, it'll then let the request through to the back end. So that's one option there where that proxy would run you know, in your secure environment in front of the application that doesn't support any of the standards, and then you can add it to any application that way. Uh, we have a blog post actually that talks about that on our developer site. So I think it's it's, if you search for add authentication to any application, um, maybe add Okta to that search, then I think that will uh, turn it up. I think that's a, a really clever solution, actually, too. Like That seems like a good workaround, especially if you're in a restricted environment where there's literally no way to do this. Although one other thing I'll just add out there for you, Eileen, is like we are a, a massive company. We work with tons of huge corporations with crazy security rules and we've gone through all sorts of compliance checks, it might be worth talking to your IT department as well about just getting the Okta browser extension included. Because like I said, we go through tons of security checks and audits and things like that. We're used to working with really large companies. So if you do need help there, like I'm sure Okta will be able to find a way to talk to your IT or security group and like make that happen too, potentially. Um, but yeah, Aaron's workaround is fantastic. Uh, if you can't do that. Love it. All right. So next question we're going to answer is from Mandeep. So Mandeep says, hey, I've recently created an OIDC app in Okta for accessing my custom application. OK, awesome. I'm migrating users from an Oracle database to Okta. <coughs> Excuse me. The Oracle user in my custom application has roles and privileges for authorization purposes. One role consists of 9 to 10 privileges or more. A cust and the custom app checks for both, checks both so it's checking both the role and privileges for executing further actions. 
how can I handle this via an Okta authorization server, or is there a better way to manage these? So it essentially sounds like this person is going to need uh, the concept of roles and privileges. Aaron, do you want to talk about the best way to accomplish this using OIDC? Yeah, we're, I, let me try to read that question again, so I can so I can find it. Which was the who was this from? Yeah, it's from uh, Man, it's, Mandeep. Yeah, Mandeep. So basically, he's saying he has the users in a custom Oracle database right now, and the users have two different types of like permissions. They have something called privileges, and they have something called roles. And his application checks both privileges and roles before making authorization decisions. Um, so you can migrate them into, uh, you can convert those into groups in Okta. Would that be the best way to do that on the Okta side, putting users into two different groups? Um, I, and then you can make a rule that adds the groups into the access token itself. So that way, when your API is checking the access token to validate it, you can, you'll get that information into the access token that you can validate at that point. Yeah, I think the only other way to do it, Mandeep, other than what Aaron's suggesting, would be to just do it directly in the authorization server in Octo. So if you go to the authorization server and you go to the claims, you can define your own custom scopes and claims in there. And so you could just define a custom one for each of those things. So like <clears throat> in your own custom database today, you might have it called privileges and roles, but in Okta, you could translate those all into just one type of thing called like a, a scope or a claim. And so you could have a custom one for all of those things. And then in your application, when you get back a token from a user, you can still check the exact same stuff. It would just be under one classification instead of two. One, one other thing I would add there is, you know, sometimes it makes sense to keep certain types of data like roles and permissions potentially um, out of Okta or, or you have a requirement to do that. And in that case, you can take advantage of um, inline token hooks and basically what Okta will do is it'll reach out to your server and give you all of the information about uh, what's currently in the access token. And then you can query your own servers and add additional information to that access token. It's handled in flight, Okta then re-signs it, and then it comes to your app kind of fully formed. So that might be another approach if uh, where, where it makes sense to kind of um, update the the hooks on the, the token on the fly. Uh, the one caveat there is that your service must respond within three seconds or Okta will just return the original token as it was. Um, so you wanna make sure that if you are gonna query, you know, an, an, an external API or, or something that's, you know, in your own um, data center that it's responsive enough that it can keep up with the, the requirements to uh, alter that, that token on the fly. Yep. Thanks for that additional context, Mike. I think that's really helpful. Um, all right. For the next question, let's go to Megan. So Megan asks, and I think this might be one for you, Aaron. Um, she says, Hey, I have an application ABC in Okta, which manages customer accounts. I can create read and write roles, AKA scopes for application for this application and grant those scopes to my users within Okta. However, now I need to be able to limit the roles based on individual customers within the application. So like I have an Okta user 1234 at dummy.com and that user should have a read role for customer one, a rewrite role for customer two and nothing for customer three. So can this be configured within Okta? So basically like I'm, it's more of a fine grained permissioning question it sounds like. Yeah, I have to think about that in Okta uh, case for a second, but I would also say that I would not use scopes for this. I would use a different claim for this use, using groups. The reason is because scopes are more about limiting what a particular application can do within the context of what a user can already do. So if you have a user who has read and write roles, then it lets you issue an access token that has read only access to a particular application. And that's more what the scopes are for in OAuth and I think if you try to use it for what you're trying to do here, you're going to find that it doesn't really map well. And that might be why you're you're finding this challenging. You know, a couple other just things I'm thinking about off the top of my head here. But, you know, like the first thing that comes to mind when I read this question, Megan, uh, 
and I might be way off base here, but like a call center type situation. So maybe you have like support agents and you have like some support administrators in a call center and support agents and administrators would both be defined as groups within Okta. And they would have certain privileges just based on the group they're in. Okay. And like Aaron said, those are not scopes within the authorization server, but let's say the person's talking to someone on the phone and that person needs support. And so maybe one person wants to grant the support agent, like read access to their data. And another support agent wants to grant the person read and write access to their data so they can like actually fix something for them. So what's a good way to model that? Well, a couple of different things you can do. So one within our authorization servers, you can define the read, write, you know, execute scopes, whatever you want. And you can define dynamic, like checking rules using our, the Okta, like, like policies basically in the authorization server to allow certain things at certain times. So that's one option. Another thing you could do is you could use our hooks. So we have inline hooks you can use and also event hooks where you can basically like get an HTTP request to your application when something's happening and your application can make a custom decision. Like, do I want to allow this? Yes or no. Um, that might be a good solution because you can basically like start making an authorization request, you know, patch into a hook, do some custom logic in your database or by talking to the user or showing them an OAuth consent screen or something along those lines. Um, and like allow this person, this customer to say, yes, I allow you to have read access or I allow you to have write access sort of like in an OAuth best practices -y type way. Uh, so those are just some additional ideas too. And actually, Mike, I, I think you might've done some of this before. Do you have any better ideas for that stuff? Um, it's a good question. Can you, can you restate once more? Yeah. So like if you. If you have users in a group, like a uh, customer support agent, but then you also want to have custom claims like read and write to customer data, uh, is there a clean way to like within Okta to, to manage that? So maybe you have someone who wants to access a customer's data and the customer should be the one to allow them to say like, yes, you have read access. Yes, you have write access. Yeah. So, you know, the, there's a couple of different ways with that. Typically, you know, you're going to have an application that's going to make a request and um, you're, you're going to get back, you know, a bunch of uh, different claims in that in that token. Um, the nice thing is that all of the frameworks, um, uh, the one that I'm most familiar with is like Spring Boot, they support functionality for saying, well, if you have this claim, you're allowed in here, but if you don't have a different claim than you're not, um, you know, so, so that's kind of out of the box functionality, but that may also be another good example of where you want to use the, uh, the inline token hooks. Um, and then you can, you know, your code can then look at who the user is and what, what, uh, claims, uh, or what additional information you kind of want to jam into that, um, token. It's kind of a very powerful and and I feel like not very well uh, publicized yet feature to be able to alter a token in flight and then have it re-signed. Um, that gives you a lot of power. So it might not even be that you define the custom claims in Okta anymore, but you have a bunch of claims that end up in the token uh, based on you know your your hook, your code that does some sort of check maybe it's against your own database or it's against some other service that determines ultimately what claims are going to end up in that token yep so hopefully that that's helpful um let us know if you have follow-up questions and we'll do our best to get back um all right next questions by pradeep and pradeep asks what's the best way to become like an octa developer and i think what they mean is like a certified octa developer i'm guessing um Micah is actually one of the people that, divine, that uh, designed our developer certification. So Micah, do you want to talk about that for a minute? Like how, how can he do it? How can he get certified, et cetera? Yeah, excellent question. Uh, and you know, I'm biased because I help uh, create our developer certification. Um, but from the, from the main Okta site, I'll share my screen in a sec, but there's some good information about um, about get, uh, getting the Okta developer, uh, the certified developer certification. Um, 
But basically, one of the things I'm proud of with this particular one is that it's a practical application. It's not memorization uh, necessarily, depends on how you learn, but um, it's not just answering uh, multiple choice questions. That's the first part. But then the second part is an actual web app that leads you through a series of use cases where you have to actually make Okta API requests. Um, so uh, I'm proud of it. It's become really popular. And um, I think, uh, again, I'm biased, but I think it's a great way to uh, to learn about uh, Okta in, in a deep kind of way. Um, and oh, I got the spinning wheel of doom. Here we go. So this is, if you go to uh, Okta.com slash services slash certification, or just, just from the top level, if you go to services and then education services, and you scroll down a bit, um, here's where it talks about the uh, the Okta certified developer um, exam. And, you know, we have a lot, we have an, a study guide and even a practice exam. So, you know, we really give you a lot of support in um, learning what you need to know to, to pass that test. Um, and like all certifications, aside from, um, well, maybe not all, but aside from you know, maybe being useful for your for your job role or, or being like a good resume stuffer, at least in this case, I think it's it's actually uh, very useful in learning the Okta management API and our APIs in general, if, you know, if that's something that's important to you. Awesome. Hopefully that was helpful. All right. I think we only have time for a couple more. I, I'm doing my best to pick the ones I think are going to be really high value for, uh, for people. Um, this, this is a design related question. So let's talk this one through for a minute. Aaron, Micah, just give your opinions on this. Cause it's very much an opinionated question. So, uh, this person says, I know this is a business and or UX decision, but could you share your perspective on building branded login pages specific to a single portal or app, knowing that the direct login in Okta will continue to exist? Does this create confusion for users knowing they have Okta credentials and application X credentials when in fact they are one in the same. The reason for this question is because uh, this person wants to embed the login experience into a new portal versus following a browser redirect to an IDP. So the way I'm going to interpret this and uh, whoever asked the question, like post for clarification if, if, I'm, if we're not interpreting this correctly, but I think what you're saying is you have like multiple applications on different domains potentially that are using Okta for authentication. And so you have these two different portals and you have the same user credentials being shared amongst both of these portals. And you don't know a good way to bubble that, that concept up to a user. So if I'm using portal A and I try to log into portal B, I may not know I have an account there already. And so I potentially try to create a new account and run into issues, et cetera. Um, Micah Aaron, what do you think this user should, should try to do to fix this issue? I don't think you're going to like my answer. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> what is it? I'm a, I'm would go more on the side of actually doing the redirect so that users do understand it is the same credential across all these applications and that it is using single sign on and that you can brand that read. You can brand that page on Okta, right? Make it look like your own page. Don't make it look like it's Okta. But by doing that redirect, it then reinforces the idea that this is the only place users enter their password. And you don't end up with users thinking they might have to enter their password in other places that might be actually phishing attempts. I think the worst offender of this is Apple, where you see your your prompt for your Apple account, your, both your iCloud as well as your system account pop up in so many different places. So the next time you get asked for your Apple password, how do you know it's actually a real prompt and not just some app on your computer that's trying to steal your password? So by using the one the one login box on the redirect page, you help reduce that risk and educate users that this is actually what a, lo a login box looks like and anything else is probably an attack. That's my opinion on it. It is a design choice though. So take that with take that for what you will. I, I'm just and gonna you know, post one that too. I, I agree with Aaron. Yeah, Mike, I, Mike, what do you think? I, yeah, I was gonna add to that also, uh, you know, same, we're all in alignment, which is, uh, and I understand that that's not always what our customers want to hear, but we're working hard to kind of make the the whole experience of uh, customizing 
that um, login experience better. Ideally, especially if you know you may have a consumer facing app and your users don't know anything about Okta, so you don't want them to ever see an Okta URL. Uh, so ideally, you'd be redirected somewhere like login.yourdomain.com. And uh, that's something that, that has not been a great experience for developers up till now, and we're working to make that better. But I have seen scenarios where um, even when you're redirecting through uh, code, when you, when you have a subdomain, uh, you can edit all the code that backs the sign-in widget. And through code, you might have different backgrounds or different logos or a totally different skin on that um, interface, depending on where they came from, or you have a lot more uh, flexibility once you're using your own subdomain to to alter that code and to make the experience that's you know going to be the, the the best for your users to have the, the best user experience. So totally aligned with what Aaron is saying. It really, from a security perspective, it is the best, most secure approach for uh, the reasons that Aaron said and others. And then we're just trying to bring like the user experience or the developer experience into alignment with that security best practice. If they're aligned, if it's super easy for developers to set up and use, and it's the best security practice, that would be like the ideal world. Uh, so, so the person who asked this question actually responded in chat and said, we did have the context correct and they agree, but they're having problems selling this to the business and UX team. So what I would say is, Hit us up um, if you want some help, like getting on a conference call with people in your team or whatever. Uh, maybe we can do something to help you out, um, or at least we can try. Um, unfortunately, though, we are out of time. We're actually a little over right now. But thank you all so much for coming. I'm really, truly sorry if we did not get to your question. There was a lot of questions this time, so we apologize. If we could do this all day, we absolutely would. Um, please take care of yourself. Stay safe out there. Stay home. Don't get sick. And uh, Thank you all so much for spending some time with us today. So uh, take it easy, everyone, on behalf of Okta. Thanks, everybody. Great questions. Yep. <laughs> all right. Bye.